This episode of Stock Club is brought to you by Hyundai. Restart your journey towards a greener world with Hyundai's next generation of zero emission cars. Find out more about their range of electric vehicles and the savings they can bring to your company and employees at Hyundai.ie. Hi there and welcome to the Stock Club podcast. I'm James and with me this week is my Wall Street co-founder and chief investor Emmett Savage and our head analyst Rory Caron. In this episode, we're talking about the battle that's brewing between Apple and Epic Games, the reason why stock splits shouldn't affect your investment strategy, and three of the most important company earnings we've seen over the past few weeks. So guys, before we start today, I just want to warn you not to say anything bad about Amazon in today's episode, because according to the terms and conditions of Amazon Music, as it gears up to start streaming podcasts, and I quote, your content may not include advertising or messages that disparage or are directed against Amazon or any service. So basically, Amazon aren't going to stream your podcasts. Um, If you say anything bad about Amazon, that's a bit authoritarian, even for Jeff Bezos, I think. Isn't this the guy who owns the Washington Post and the tagline of which is democracy dies in the dark? <laughs> wow. Sorry, have I, have I missed something? I thought this was Mr. Yeah. Free Speech, Free Press. Wow. It's, it's, uh, it's pretty bad. Are you claiming then that this podcast is one of the cornerstones of democracy, Rory? Well, not yet, but um, <laughs> I think I've just got us banned off the Amazon Music Store. So. Oh. <laughs> just if, get if it over and done with. <laughs> if any of our listeners do actually listen to us on Amazon Music uh, and we suddenly disappear, please let us know um, so we know we're being silenced and we can uh, start They're some sort have of campaign. They're going to a time um, monitoring this. Like, are they going to listen to every single podcast? Well, it'll boost our ratings, so <laughs> why not? <laughs> <laughs> Well, moving on from Amazon and their their kind of their new rules about podcasting, let's talk about Apple. So previously on this podcast, we've spoken about how Apple is one of the only big tech companies at the moment that's managed to avoid serious antitrust scrutiny. Um, At the congressional hearings held last month, for example, many commentators questioned why Apple was actually appearing, considering that the company does not, in their own words, have a dominant marketing share in any of the markets where we do business. Um, However, Questions have been raised recently about Apple's governance over its flagship app store after Fortnite, the massively popular online video game, was removed from the platform. This is due to its publisher Epic Games introducing a direct payment option in the game that circumvented the 30% fee Apple usually charges for in-app purchases. Um, Rory, I'm going to come to you first. Can you pull this situation apart for us a little and kind of explain what's going on between Epic Games and Apple? Yeah, well, just first, on the topic of Apple and being anti-competitive, I mean, we work within the confines of Apple's policies, and Apple is by far, well, the most obviously anti-competitive of all the companies, in my estimation. (laughs) Um, And, you know, that's just a function of how Apple has always behaved. Apple, for years, has been a company that maintained very strict controls over both its hardware and it's software going all the way back to when they first started. You know, you couldn't license Mac OS. You had to, you could only get it through the Mac computer. And the fact, you know, the fact that Apple only allows, let's say, pre-approved apps onto its hardware, and I'm talking specifically about the iPhone now, actually has massive benefits. Okay, so yeah. you think about, um, people are typically quite nervous about installing third-party software on things like their computers as they should be because there's you know millions of malware and viruses and spyware floating around the internet that can destroy your computer or skim your credit card information or any of that kind of thing so owning the installation process is actually like created this actual massive market uh, for consumers who are suddenly willing to download apps and thus drew in this huge pool of talented developers to make apps so you know the, the fact that they own that process was a benefit to everyone And then you add to this that Apple took control of the entire payment process, which worked out very well for consumers because, first of all, Apple already had their credit card information. If they ever used anything on iTunes, they'd already put their credit card information into Apple. And there was an an extra element of trust there. You know, you're not paying some developer that you've never heard of. You're paying Apple and Apple's paying the developer and Apple's the one sending you the receipt. And if there's, you know, you again, you don't have to give your credit card out to someone you don't know. And if there's any problems with payments or anything, you're kind of trusting that Apple is going to sort it out, you know. And so, again, this is and it's good for developers, too. People are more willing to spend money on the App Store than they would be, you know, just buying something, some random piece of uh, software off the Internet. But, of course, there's 
you know, a, a cut. Apple takes this 30% cut. And on top of that, they control the entire customer relationships. You know, we had problems for years, you'll remember this, that we couldn't even give people refunds. You know, yeah. when people came in and they, you know, maybe they bought it and realized they didn't want it and they asked for a refund. We, even though we wanted to, we couldn't actually give them a refund. We had to tell them, send them to Apple and basically coach them on how to go through Apple's refund process. And this led to like, you know, the amount of time we wasted trying to deal with this stuff and that we got negative reviews, even though we were yeah, doing yeah. our best to try and get people their money back. And, you know, so, you know, there's plenty of downside to this as well, you know, and then you look at things like, you know, I know Emmett, you and me both like uh, Audible, um, great app, love listening to audiobooks. You can't actually download or pay to, and download an audiobook through the Audible app. You have to go to Amazon and buy the, the book or uh, audible.com buy the audiobook and then when you go back into the audible app uh you have this new audiobook on your phone so you know there's there's pros and cons to apple's kind of monopolistic power on the app store and how it operates a lot of the times it seems petty by apple it seems like they're like yeah. you know they're they're squeezing people for everything they can when what they really should be focusing on is making that iPhone and the App Store the most incredible experience because it, it already is. I think we can all agree that the iPhone is one of the greatest inventions in the history of mankind, one of the most essential tools in it, to everyone these days. And Apple owns this and they own the, the whole ecosystem. And so the fact that they're getting scrappy over small payment amounts just to pump up their services revenue kind of disappoints me. Yeah, and they're they're very cutthroat about it too. Like they wasted no time in in kicking Fortnite off the platform. Oh, do we know how cutthroat they be? <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 might, I might be reopening old wounds here. <laughs> yeah, let's mm -hmm. let's stay off that topic. That could be a whole other uh, podcast just on its own. We'll be we'll be banned off Apple and Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. We'll be off all the major platforms. Um, but yeah, go, coming back to what Epic did. So Epic, okay, all right. This was essentially a stunt by Epic, um, who are the makers of Fortnite. They released a version of their uh, game, Fortnite, hugely popular game, with their own payment system, which rent, which basically went around Apple's 30% cut. And Apple instantly just threw them off and have now sent them letters saying, you know, if you, if you don't fix this, we're going to not only re remove you from the App Store, we're going to kill all the versions of your game that appear on any Apple devices. We're going to get rid of your de developer's license. We're not going to let you develop any more apps for, their, for any of our, uh, our platforms. And this is, this is going to be a big fight. And the reason Epic are doing it is because they see that this is, you know, this, there's a whole other backstory. And if you want to understand the economics behind Epic's uh, business model, you'll understand that they also have like a game engine in the background, which they're trying to license out to people. And the 30% base, the, the cut basically makes that business uh, quite unviable but this yeah. is the genius thing what what epic did was that when they put in the new payment system they simultaneously lowered the price of all their in-game currency and now they're claiming that they were passing on the savings to their to their users and by apple removing them from the app store they're acting against the consumer so they're being anti-consumer now which is yeah. as we've talked about when it comes to antitrust it's all about the consumer. The U.S. has historically worked under the premise that anything that makes things better for the consumer is fine. That's so not being e anti-competitive. <laughs> e Epic came to this fight primed for a lawsuit, pretty much. Oh yeah, this was—they knew exactly what was going to happen, and they—they're starting a fight, and they think you know, they think that considering how big they are and how popular the game is, that they have you know some sort of. I don't know. They're they're not quite. It's not quite David versus Goliath. Let's say they yeah. have a little bit of a fight in them. Um, I don't see Apple backing down. But well, yeah. Well, as you've kind of alluded to already, this isn't the first time Apple have gotten trouble for this. The probably most famous one previously was with Spotify, um, who 
who also lo- who are sorry in the middle of of um, uh, an EU investigation into complaints by Spotify that this thirty percent tax by Apple was anti competitive. Um, Epic Game is also reportedly hoping to create some sort of coalition against Apple. It's been uh, reported that it's trying to get the likes of Spotify, other um, companies like Match dot com, and even Facebook, who've already voiced their support for Epic. They're trying to create this coalition of of companies to kind of fight against Apple or, or go against this practice by Apple. Do you think? kind of this this gathering of forces w- will actually have any effect on apple well i think when you look at specific companies like you think about spotify and we've talked about this a lot like apple is clearly being anti-competitive to spotify there is absolutely yeah. no way they could say they aren't they have apple music comes pre-installed on every single iphone they don't have to pay 30 percent to to apple so they get they have a pricing um a margin advantage there you think about the new arcade thing that's coming out that is going to basically try to squeeze game developers so that's hugely anti-competitive as well as i've moaned about for a long time now you can't even make spotify the default music player on your iphone you have to every time you request something off siri you have to add on spotify otherwise it defaults to apple music which i don't have a subscription for so you know there's i think what's happening is companies are slowly building individual examples of apple being anti-competitive in the hope that at some point down the line all these examples are going to coalesce into one big argument that here lads you can't do this you can't have monopolistic power over an entire ecosystem and compete with us and you know change your rules whenever you feel like you know so there's an awful lot going on this is this epic uh lawsuit is kind of a more high profile version of, of things that have been going on for years yeah and you know, I I think Apple should probably start watching themselves a little bit closer because they will get in trouble at one point. Yeah, well, Emmett, I want to come to you next. Like, this, this is an argument we've seen played out in kind of a different guise with Google and the advertisements they show on search engine. And there is an argument that, you know, Apple has made its hardware, it's made its iPhones, its MacBooks, it's created this app store. Should they not have the right to govern over this app store as they see fit? You know, where where does the line between... Um, you know, running a product that they've created and anti-competitiveness or monopolistic practices. Where where do we draw that line? Or is that something we're all trying to figure out? Well, I think we're trying to figure it. But when you look at the fact that Apple and Google's pricing in the app stores, the appropriate app stores, mirror each other exactly, it's the greatest example of a duopoly that I can actually think of, um, mm. where pricing to the penny to the to the percentage point is the exact same. So effectively, by agreement or just common practice, they've settled on a price point that doesn't make either slightly more competitive than the other. And, you know, when you look at, I was reading Apple, they were talking to the online journal The Verge there during the week, they made a statement and said, the problem Epic has created for itself is one that can easily be remedied if they submit an update of their app and reverse to comply with the guidelines. And we as a company, my Wall Street and Roy alluded to it there, have sampled the wrath of Apple and they simply, they just bang the one drum, obey our rules. And Mm. when there is no opportunity to engage in reasonable dialogue, you know, you see the things happen that we're looking at now. And ultimately, you know, a dialogue needs to open. I mean, if I'm not mistaken, Taylor Swift (laughs) got Apple to change their policy on Apple Music. She had the power of brand. She had an audience. And I suppose Epic in in a similar world have a um i suppose a, a, a an audience you know of similar size and scale um whether it is an abuse of power whether there are chinese walls in the business that should be obeyed and you know should each sector of the business be treated like with you know its own dose of anti-competitive viewpoint uh, i'm not too sure like as I have to be careful what I wish for. The thing that makes this business great is its ability to build an ecosystem. So kind of you're almost arguing for socialism versus capitalism, but then for (laughs) small businesses, you actually have, you can see the problems transpire. And we've lived, we've lived that problem ourselves where we accidentally didn't obey a rule and had to very quickly figure out ourselves which rule we weren't obeying and fix it. The problem, yeah. I think a lot of the problem is the term anti-competitive as well. Like, you know, every business is supposed to be anti-competitive. You're, you, you, if you're not anti-competitive, you're not doing very well in business. You're trying to beat your competitors. <laughs> That's the whole point. Yeah. It's when yeah. 
it's when things so that definitely the definition you know we need to figure out between anti-competitive like what's anti-competitive and what's illegally anti-competitive that's yeah. still such a kind of it's it's old world they haven't really updated that that terminology for for what we're looking at now which is a product that every single person has in their pocket all the time and a marketplace within that product that's you know guarded very strictly the anti-competitive rules that were written for the railroads and uh, the bell telephone company don't apply today we need to we need to update how we think about illegally being anti-competitive Mm, absolutely very good point um, i'm sure we'll be coming back to this point at some stage in the future anyway uh let's move on then so as a rule we usually don't spend too much time on this podcast dissecting company earnings um as you've pointed out before rory if you're planning on holding a company uh for 10 years then a single quarter only represents about one fortieth of that entire time invested which means that like a panic over a small miss on earnings or revenue doesn't really mean that much in the the grand scheme of things However, considering that the most recent round of earnings were the first to report on the full effects of the coronavirus restrictions, we decided we're going to take a look today at three companies that really stood out to us that reported recently. Let's come to Home Depot first, who actually reported this week. Rory, I'll throw them over to you. How's Home Depot looking in the current environment? Yeah, Home Depot is one of those stocks. I think Jason Moser said it well, that it works in every environment. You know, in a good economy, there's home builders building new homes, and so they're they're getting a lot of that pro business. When the economy is bad, people aren't moving home; they're they're doing up their old home, so they're getting the DIY business there. You know, let's think about Home Depot and uh, and think. You know, there's a deadly virus going around, and um, the country's basically in lockdown. So, what does Home Depot do? It has its best quarterly comparable sales ever. Yeah, <laughs> up twenty three point four percent. Wow, um, that was that was fueled by twelve point three percent increase in transactions, ten point one percent increase in the average ticket. This look, do you want to hear how well they did? Right, thirteen out of fourteen product categories, all three divisions, all nineteen regions, all forty markets comped up double digits every week. Wow. Every week, <laughs> every incredible. Week. That is absolutely uh, incredible. I don't ever recall insane. that happening before. <laughs> DIY was its best performer. Pro saw double di- digit increases. Its urban markets were just as strong as its rural markets. And look, we, we know what's going on here. Um, entertainment money, going to bars, going to restaurants, going to gigs, going on holidays, all that money is shifting to home spending. People are starting yeah. to realize this isn't going away anytime soon. We are likely going to be spending the vast majority of autumn and winter in our homes. And those homes now need to become multifunctional spaces where not only do can we live, but we can work, we can play, we can exercise, we can study. Whatever we need to do, we have to be able to do it in our homes. So they better be up to scratch. And that is Home Depot is doing very, very well from this. There's nothing like sitting at home working and kind of noticing the chips and the paint in the wall or, or those cracks <laughs> or, or as happened with me, a, a growing damp patch in the corner of the ceiling that you get a little bit worried about. <laughs> Uh, so that's Home Depot. And yeah, and as you mentioned, that they really are. And I think that's one of the, the most fascinating things about this company is that they seem to benefit no matter what the economic conditions are. There seems to be a, a, a good thesis for them benefiting. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, it's uh, and it's one of those. And we talked about it before as being an, a bit of an Amazon proof business as well, because the stuff you buy in Home Depot isn't the stuff you're typically going to get uh, sent to, you, you know. Uh, what was it's the the weight to value uh, ratio where yeah. it's very profitable to ship a diamond ring somewhere, but it's not very profitable to ship a bag of cement. So yeah. and and people like the Home Depot experience. They go in, they touch all the tools and figure out which one they want to use and get a bit of advice from the um, customer support guys in there. And it, it's it's a whole experience. And and Home Depot is doing very well, even in uh, an environment where there's a deadly plague on the loose. Yeah, absolutely. Let's move on then to the next company we want to chat about, which is Trupanion. Emmett, you were having a look at Trupanion recently, which the company has been on quite a run. It has, yeah. So Trupanion is a low-cost pet insurance company and it's operating in the US, Canada, and I think Puerto Rico. And how it generates its revenue is a subscription business. People subscribe to get um, the equivalent of health, well, it is health insurance for their pets. So as of market close yesterday, just so people can picture the numbers, um, Trupanion was just over $2 billion business by market cap. It had about $105 million in cash and $27 million in debt and about 14% insider ownership. So those 
three numbers and you know we, we prefer to talk about the story but those three numbers certainly initially would uh, for me be green traffic lights nice size two billion plenty of cash more cash than debt good insider ownership but according to Trupanion and it's the story that's more interesting only one percent of pets in the US today have health assurance. And according yeah. to the business, Americans spent $96 billion on their pets in 2019. And that trend is actually rising. So they are a small cap stock with plenty of cash, with a huge market opportunity and quite a nice brand as well. And in Q1, I suppose Q1 numbers were probably aided by coronavirus because the total pets enrolled um, in the Trupanion system rose by 25% over the uh, prior year period. So a bit like Home Depot, you know, people are looking inside their four walls and making improvements inside those four walls. And pets and the care for your pets is something that matters to people hugely. And the well-being of your pet is a very, very important matter in millions, tens of millions of homes around the world. But I guess when you look at Trupanion, ultimately what the business is, is an insurance company. And whether we're talking about Markel, which is speciality insurance for like riding schools and karate schools, or if we're looking at AIG, the big broad based insurance company they're all insurance businesses so in that industry the, the the what's known as the combined ratio is the one that most matters and the combined ratio is a measure of profitability used in the industry to gauge how well it's performing and how it's calculated is they, they take it they sum up all the losses and expenses and then divide all of those by the earned premium. And stick with me, so the most insurers operate with a combined ratio of 95%, which means that 5% or less is their profit margin. Trupanion's yeah. operating margin is 13%, and their ambition is to reach 15%. So in the industry, not only are they operating in a, I suppose, niche or niche area, with a giant and growing opportunity, but they're doing so in a very efficient way. So yeah. um, I think the trend is very much the friend for Trupanion. I think it is a great investment. It's not going to be all that exciting. I mean, insurance yeah. investing is never all that exciting. But if you look at the ratio that most, most matters in the industry, um, when you look at the, founding, at the founders, their um, insider ownership, the position the business has, I think it's I think it's a really good one, and, and I'm a big fan. And as a result, its share price has had a run, but it's very hard to find a share that hasn't had a run. I think last October, Trupanion was sitting at around twenty bucks a share, and today it's around sixty-one bucks a share. Um, but as we all know, trying to find a stock that hasn't had a run in the last half year is actually quite difficult. Absolutely. It's an interesting company. It's it's a double bagger since we added it to the shortlist just near, almost three years ago. Rory, every time we talk about Trupanion, I, I'm always reminded of the time you talked about, was it pet parents or the trend of, of people <laughs> uh, of treating pets as their children rather than actually having children? Yeah, the, the, what do they call them? Fur babies? Fur babies. That was uh, God. Uh, that disturbing. company that I was talking about last week, Emma, just got into pet insurance, Lemonade. Oh, yeah. Oh, I see. So a whole new competitor. That is very interesting because you're right. For existing insurance companies to kind of widen the net somewhat and just offer insurance for pets, it isn't that difficult. And also um, there is a higher opportunity for fraud, fraudulent claims, which I think we might have spoken about before. I mean, your cat or your dog is not going to uh, object or, or <laughs> plead that they didn't get a certain <laughs> procedure, you know, so yeah, you yeah, kind yeah. of. Um, but I, I hear you, though, it's it is interesting that Lemonade now are after going into the industry well i mean when you think about only one to two percent of pets are insured plenty of room for companies to, yeah. to make money yeah. in this yeah. space so definitely want to keep yeah. an eye on yeah. let's come to the last company then and rory you're talking about a, a relatively recent addition to the my wall street shortlist which is c limited yeah another example of when uh, a user gets in touch and uh, drops some gold in our laps it does our job jeff, for us i think was it <laughs> was it jeff who, who sent us onto this company c limited mm -hmm. um, yeah yeah, we've, you know, long time user Jeff. Thanks for that one. Um, one thing we, yeah, we've talked about this quarter multiple times. We've talked about uh, e-commerce. You know, we saw some incredible results recently from the likes of Amazon, from Shopify, from Etsy just a few weeks ago. And uh, one thing we haven't talked quite as much about is gaming, which, as you'd expect, is having 
a very strong couple of quarters, you know, gaming, you can do it from your couch, it's entertaining, there's a social element to it, and in terms of, you know, in terms of entertainment hours per dollar spent, I think gaming, you know, knocks pretty much everything else out of the park, especially if you've played anything like uh, Red Dead Redemption, which took up quite a lot of my year last year. So how do you think a company that combines gaming and e-commerce was going to do in this quarter? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, This Sea Limited, which is a company based in Singapore, which is essentially kind of a, it's like a mixture of Amazon, Mercado Libre, Take-Two Interactive, it's you know, it's got it's got it's got an e-commerce side. It's got a gaming side. It's backed by Tencent. They saw adjusted revenues up ninety three percent over the quarter, year over year. Uh, the gaming elements called Garana was saw revenues up sixty one percent. They now have nearly half a billion quarterly active users. They saw paying users in the gaming uh, section of the of the business go up ninety one percent. So fifty million paying users. And now, you know, you turn over to their e-commerce uh, side, which is a company called Shopee. Um, their revenues are up 188 uh, percent, with gross metric volume of 110 percent and gross orders of 150 percent. And they recently enough launched a digital wallet, kind of similar to PayPal kind of thing. And there's 1.6 billion in total payments volume going through that uh, digital wallet in the quarter. So, you know, talk about big numbers. This is a company that is firing in on hyper growth mode. They are dominating markets that they enter. Their game, uh, Free Fire, is the biggest played game in Indonesia and Brazil, which is the two largest markets. They're really challenging to own the e-commerce space in Southeast Asia, which, you know, I was there a few years ago. It's a wonderful part of the world, wonderful people. And I, it's one of those, It's pro- this is probably the company I'd, I'd recommend people investing in if they want to get exposure to that part of the world. It seems to be a very well-run business. The disclaimer there is that they are spending a huge, huge amount of money. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, that's just kind of what hyper-growth companies do. They spend an awful lot of money and they hope that at one point the profits start ticking over. So it's uh, it's a high-risk business, but I, I really like it. I like the manager. He, he seems like a nice guy. He named himself, he chose his English name after the character in Forrest Gump because he kind of, he felt that kind of quiet sensibility suited him so um i love lots that of, lots of things to like about this business I love that. That, that's good enough reason for me to invest <laughs> yeah, i know I, I thought that was that's like the, the loveliest little bit of trivia i've ever, I've ever researched about a business yeah. well emmett you mentioned that it's hard to find a company that hasn't been on a run sea limited are up over 60 percent since we picked them in june so uh they're definitely benefiting from from the current trends um so there are three companies that we we want to look at after their earnings let's move on um and take a quick look at what's going on on in my wall street at the moment so far this month we've already published august stock of the month selection along with the exclusive stock of the month podcast this month's pick has already turned out to be a strong one for us up more than 12 percent at time of recording and joining a list of stocks that has returned an average of 125 percent since we started we also added a brand new stock to our market beating shortlist this week an exciting company that focuses on web infrastructure and security Members of the My Wall Street community can read this full write-up now, but if you're not a member yet, you can sign up for a free trial by just clicking on the link in the notes for today's show. Before we move on, I also want to mention an exciting new collaboration we're running with our friends over at NOAA. NOAA, spelled N-O-A, offers professionally read versions of articles from the likes of the Financial Times, Bloomberg, The Economist, and a host of other top publishers. I found our app a really good way to keep on top of the latest business stories that I just don't have time to read. Over the next few months, my Wall Street will actually be curating some of the investment-focused playlists for NOAA. The first of these series, Are You Prepared for the COVID Debt Crunch, went live on NOAA today, Friday, August 21st. In this, you'll hear more from me, followed by audio articles from Bloomberg and the Financial Times, read by NOAA's narrators. We're also going to have one of NOAA's chief editors, David O'Donovan, join us on the next episode of the Stock Club podcast. David spent seven years as a risk analyst at one of the world's largest financial market making firms and he'll be sharing some of his experiences with intraday trading as well as why he believes that speculating is something that's best left to the pros. Be sure to tune in in two weeks and check that out. Um, Let's go on to jargon buster so guys. So the first question we have is about stock splits. Um, Tesla and Apple have both recently announced stock splits. So Emmett, just want to throw this to you. What are stock splits and should we be concerned if a company we own is having a stock split? 
Sure. Well, I, I've seen and observed so many stock splits in my own folio over the last 25 years. I, I couldn't even begin to list them all off. And um, they they effectively mean nothing. So um, a simple case is that a, a business decides to split its shares two for one. So you, you get two shares for every share you used to have and the yeah. price of that share halves so the math of of what you own remains exactly the same there's double the number of shares in issuance and all of those shares have halved in value now it doesn't mean that all shares split two for one sometimes it's three for one four for one but the intent of a share split is that it keeps the share price within a trading range that is perceived as optimal. You can also do yeah. a reverse split. So a company that might have a share price of two or three dollars might feel that it's um, outside the radar of a lot of investors and um, might decide to do a reverse uh, stock split. So it actually rolls up its shares. But either way, there is a perception in the US, um, which is quite real, that shares below five bucks and I suppose above a higher level, and I'm not too sure even really what that higher level is anymore, but 200 bucks maybe, mm. um, that when you fall outside the, this band, you you become less appealing to retail investors. Now, the, the advent of fractional share ownership in the last, I suppose, five to 10 years has largely addressed the need for businesses to stock split. So you can go into the My Wall Street app today and buy 10 bucks worth of Amazon shares. Uh, you don't need to consider or worry about how much is one single unit. Um, yeah. But so stock splits are continuing at a lower pace than they used to because of fractional share ownership. Um, and we've seen a few of them recently. And as you said, Tesla and Apple are the two big high profile stock splits we've seen. Yeah. And as I said, they usually shouldn't have an effect on the share price. But as we saw with Tesla, I think any news about Tesla these days results in a bump in uh, for the share price yeah. there. If, uh, if I was a shareholder of Amazon or Google, I would be like on to investors relations being like, you guys need to split this stock. Yeah. Look what happened with Tesla. <laughs> it's up like 27% <laughs> since they split. Why aren't yeah. you doing it? Yeah. <laughs> but it's that's not, actually quite a worry. Sorry, Rory, that's actually quite a worrying sign, really, because it shows that um, there's a misunderstanding from a yeah. lot of money. You know, there's a huge <laughs> pent up <laughs> excitement over absolutely no news whatsoever, which is adding billions of dollars of value to a company. So I agree with you, Rory. I think um, we might do a stock split on my Wall Street and see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's move on to the next question then. So this came in from Keith uh, via email. He asked, what does it mean if a company company is spinning out part of its business and what does that mean for the shareholders he asked this with specific reference to sap um who are spinning out part of their business qualtrics um rory i might throw that over to you yeah without knowing the exact uh details of the sap qualtrics spin-off a spin-off is like when a when a business sees one of its kind of uh segments or or subsidiary and decides for a reason that you know that business could possibly operate better by itself or you know we could create shareholder value by letting that business kind of split away from the bigger company and operate by itself yeah that's what a, a corporate spin-off is it's typically done to allow the spun-off business to well to allow both businesses really to focus on their core competencies and not kind of trample on each other's feet uh when it comes to how they're run probably the most high uh, profile spin-off we've seen over the last 10 years was when um, PayPal spun off from eBay yeah. and now I mean you think about uh, PayPal and how they've done since they got away from eBay you know one of the they've they're much much bigger than what used to be their parent company because they just operate better as by themselves and and that's what a spin-off is it te it typically creates shareholder value I think I haven't got the figures in front of me but I do, do remember reading that um company spin-offs tend to be good for both companies that, that spin off if you look at it historically so if you know if you're is he is the i'm not sure the user does he own shares in sap because we don't have the, the no company i'm not in sure our, in our showroom but look it's just it's it's they're just splitting the business into and and it's nothing to really be worried about you you own shares in both companies when the spin-off happens usually cool but what we're looking for based on the last two conversations are spin-offs and splits so yeah. if we can find a spin-off with a share split, we're actually we, we're on the front <laughs> <foot. laughs> 
Uh, so the last question then is uh, comes from Darren via email too, and he asks, "What is our opinion on chip stocks, and why are there none in the my Wall Street shortlist?" Emmett, do you want to take that? Yeah, well, personally, I've had a mixed history in chip investing, James, and and Sierra Wireless uh, comes to mind as one of the investments I had in the not great category. Although now that I think about it, I think they were in MEMS, which are uh, micro electromechanical systems. But let's not go there. The reason we haven't gone for any chip stocks to this point is that um, it's extraordinarily advanced technology that involves inventory and is a single purchase item for the buyers. Now, yeah. there have been some outstandingly good chip investment opportunities over the last uh, one, two and five years. No question about it. And we have seen some of the darlings of the chip world like Nvidia fall to lows and rise to new highs. And uh, there's no question or doubt that there have been some good ones that we missed. Um, and we have debated chip stocks on many occasion. And we have found that really the, the fact that these businesses have fierce competitors on the most bleeding edge, cutting edge of, of, of uh, technology and are building, fabricating <coughs> these chips and putting them on shelves, so to speak, um, just brings a, an element of the unknown that doesn't feel altogether unlike the pharmaceutical industry, yeah. which some of our listeners will know I have a personal aversion to. But um, we, we haven't at any point ever said we are not picking a chip stock. We have debated it and came very close to the line on a couple of different stocks. I'm sure we'll go there eventually. We do, of course, regret and lament missing NVIDIA, but um, they're still for sale um, and we, there are plenty more that we can look at. So we do have, um, we have several on our radar. We just haven't brought them over the line just yet. Okay, thanks. Uh, let's move on then to the elevator pitch to finish out this episode. So in the last episode of Stock Club, we talked about Microsoft's plans to buy TikTok. Uh, in the last two weeks, it seems that there are plenty more potential suitors for the social media company, with companies like Oracle and Twitter suddenly coming to the fore and throwing their hats into the ring to buy TikTok. Um, my elevator pitch for you guys today is what company do you think is most suited to buy TikTok? Rory, I'll come to you first. You can't say Peladon. <laughs> <laughs> Imagine if they did. Yeah. <laughs> um, now the company I think should buy TikTok um, is one that hasn't really gotten much discussion at all, which is Disney. Yeah. Um, I you know a couple of years ago Disney was looking at Twitter as a potential acquisition, um, in a because they were looking for new distribution channels for their incredible library of uh, content and IP. And at the moment, Disney seems to be spending most of its time suing TikTok for stealing their song. <laughs> so why don't they just buy them and yeah. use it as a content delivery system? I mean, it, you know, I, I understand the hesitation would be that it's one of these user generated uh, content businesses that you have very little control over what com what goes on. But look, you know, Disney needs to get into the new world this could be a great new business model for them yeah i like that idea it was a, an ex-disney um chairman wasn't it or what was his name uh, yeah Jeffrey exactly katzenberg. kevin myers oh no i was talking about oh, jeffrey no, well. katzenberg with a uh, quibby the, oh, yeah, well, <laughs> the the poor man's <laughs> tiktok well on top of that kevin meyer who was uh thought of as the heir apparent to um bob Iger, was was didn't get the job uh, a few months ago and he became the ceo of tiktok so wow. uh, you know yeah come come on come on back kevin <laughs> we'll give you the ceo job now if you bring us tiktok <laughs> emmett who do you think should buy tiktok well i, I see tiktok as youtube v2.0 i see it as the next youtube and um therefore i think it's a perfect fit for google um yeah. you know when google bought youtube all those years ago the world was aghast at the price they paid um and I think the world would be far less shocked if they paid a multiple fold of that for, for uh, TikTok. And I think it's a perfect fit into their portfolio, which is all about engaging in advertising. You know, I was going to go with Calavo, the avocado people, or maybe a lot of technology, <laughs> the, teeth, <laughs> the teeth straightening folks. But I thought, no, nah, Google probably works better. I was just the thinking. The Twitter thing was best because like that, the idea that Twitter would buy them was so funny because it was like Twitter would be less valuable than yeah. TikTok. Yeah. So essentially TikTok would be like, okay, we'll let an American company buy us by buying an American company. Yeah. How do you like that? <laughs> so now we own Twitter. 
Yeah. I was just thinking so how much like I... like a I, reverse merger of equals. I, I was just thinking how much I'd enjoy seeing Google argue to antitrust regulators that they should be allowed to buy TikTok. Oh yeah, good luck with that, Google. <laughs> um, so that's it from this week's Stock Club. Don't forget about all the great new stuff in my Wall Street at the moment. If there's anything you want us to discuss or explain on the next episode, make sure to get in touch with us. You can find us on Twitter as usual. That's at my Wall Street HQ. Or email us at pod at mywallstreet.com. That's P-O-D at mywallstreet.com. Don't forget to subscribe to Stock Club. And if you're enjoying the podcast, please leave a review for us on whatever platform you listen to us on. From us here today, thanks for listening. We'll talk to you in two weeks. Happy investing. This episode of Stock Club is brought to you by Hyundai. Restart your journey towards a greener world with Hyundai's next generation of zero emission cars. Find out more about their range of electric vehicles and the savings they can bring to your company and employees at Hyundai.ie.